you okay? <laughs> right? <clears throat> Come on in, especially blue snap people. You guys can get off the couch. Come on. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> we all right, Manny. Come on down. Just hurry up with the product. So we'll get everyone in here. So it's such a great day outside. Hopefully there wasn't too bad of traffic. But uh, I just want to welcome everyone and thank everyone for coming. It's kind of a big deal for us at Blue Snap. Um, about five or six years ago, we have an office on the sixth floor, and there's about four or five of us there. And uh, we were aspiring to be able to fill the office on the sixth floor and to get to a point where we built uh, 12,000 square feet down here and we can fit about 75 people. We opened this up a couple months ago. It's really a tribute to the growth of the company, it's a tribute to our customers, a tribute to our employees, everybody that's really worked hard over the last five years to get to where we are. I mean, Blue Snaps just had a great run. We've been doubling the company. We've been adding people all over the world. We've been adding customers. It's been a lot of fun. And so um, I get to travel a lot. I get to hang out with a lot of people. And I thought, wow, you know what? There's a lot of great people and companies in Boston that do fun uh, FinTech. And we're going to call it FunTech tonight, Henry. Is that all right? Whatever <laughs> you are. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so I'm really happy that uh, this panel of guests came to join us. Um, I know them all well. I know them all personally. They've run really successful companies. I thought it would be great if they shared a little bit with each of us about uh, the companies that they're at, a little bit about themselves, kind of what's up in innovation. And we'll ask a few questions going around, I'll open up the questions, but it's going to be pretty casual, a little informal. And so um, I think maybe we'll just start with Henry, who's next to me. And if you guys don't know Henry, um, he was the founder and CEO of a company called Cayenne, it used to be Merchant Warehouse which was acquired by a company called um, Tesis, which is now merged with a company called Global Payments, if you keep all that straight. Say that fast after a couple of drinks. But anyway, he's, uh, he's a unicorn. Did I say that? He's the king of swipe. And um, I can't wait to he tells you a lot about uh, what has made Kyan successful. So can I pass the mic to you? Sure. Sure. So first off, uh, it's great to be back here at Kyan. Um, so if you don't know, this is basically about half the staff works here at Blue Snap now, <laughs> and half the investors uh, are here too. So um, we started uh, Merchant Warehouse Cayenne back in '99. Um, moved to Boston here, and it was a, a bootstrap, uh, or it was a completely bootstrap company. We didn't have outside investors, and it took us. Uh, we were the overnight unicorn. It took us uh, 20 years to finally exit uh, when we did last year. Uh, to TSIS, now Global, which is actually great. They never wasted uh, money on business cards, changing my Cayenne ones for TSIS, and we're already bought again. Um, <laughs> center, center, yeah, center, another hundred bucks. Uh, but um, yeah, we 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 were in the uh, payments business on the point of sale side, card present domestic. Um, our uh, our play was really making the POS integration easier. And also allowing the, the merchants and ISVs to get a lot more out of that POS integration. We actually um, pivoted the company several times. The biggest one was in 2011, 2012, when we moved from about having seven or eight uh, people in the technology group. We've got now, I think, probably 150 or 200 across what, what used to be Cayenne, Cayenne Legal Entity, thesis. Um, and really started to transform it more into the focus on the ISVs and, and software developers and building out our own product. We didn't see a good one in the market that did what we needed it to do. So uh, much like Blue Snap, we had to go out and build it on our own. And Boston's been a fantastic market for us. Uh, I think the one thing we really got right was actually building this company in Boston rather than some of the other places out there. I think that when you look at uh, the talent pool you can pull from here in Boston and the, uh, the amount of schools we can pull from, uh, now the amount of FinTech people in the space, in just downtown Boston alone, uh, it's been pretty amazing for us. And that ultimately uh, led to a, a great outcome for Parthenon and, and uh, the employees. Um, we sold in uh, January of last year to Tesis. Uh, and uh, I guess a billion dollars is the unicorn mark, according to Ralph. And uh, that's where we fortunately ended up. So it was a great outcome. That's great. Yeah. And Wikipedia. <laughs> Which is almost the same. So uh, next is uh, Jordan who I think we first met was in London, if I remember right. I was roaming around London and ran into this 
great American who happens to know a lot about payments and fintech. And we're really excited to have you here because BlueSnap has recently done an arrangement with Bank of America where Bank of America is now reselling BlueSnap's e-commerce platform. And we're part of their our fees or bids if they choose, which is great. And uh, Jordan is kind of the lead in Boston for the technology and the fintech company. So she's out seeing a lot of them working with a lot of them, and we have a great relationship. We're a client of theirs, um, and now we're partners, which is really exciting, and I think it'd be great if you share some insights. You yeah. see, I also know you spend a lot of time volunteering your time. I don't have time to do that yeah. in between how busy we keep you, but uh, we'd love to hear more about that and your insights. Yeah. Hi, everyone. So uh, thank you so much, Ralph, for introducing me and, and having me here today. So. My name is Jordan Lickey, and I'm a Senior Vice President and Senior Relationship Manager at Bank of America in our middle market commercial banking team. So our middle market is companies with uh, revenues of $50 million all the way to $2 billion in sales. So it's a pretty big range. Uh, within that, I have somewhat of a specialization, like Ralph said, in the technology space, um, which, as you can imagine, in Boston is very active. Um, so it's a lot of fun. The companies I work with are all uh, uh, some of the hottest tech companies in Boston and all disruptors in their sub-vertical. Um, and I would go so far as to say that some of them are even uh, headed down a path of changing the world, which is pretty cool to be able to work with those companies every day and to sort of be um, helping those companies grow as they do that. So it's a lot of fun, and I love what I do, and like I said, I'm happy to be here. Thanks so much. Looking forward to winning more business together. Yes, that's great. So next, Mike. Um, I think you and I met maybe five or six years ago, probably over a glass of wine at a payments conference, or maybe hanging out with Karen Webster at payments.com at her shows. Maybe that's where we first met. Um, I would think I was emceeing a dinner that night. You said, who's this guy? What's he doing? But anyway, um, I don't know if you guys know about um, Flywire, but this company has been amazingly successful. Okay. Um, they, he'll tell you all about what they've done. Um, how successful they are working on transferring money all around the world. You just told me up to 400 employees, like, wow, um, just raised $100 million. This company is growing really quickly. So, Mike, we'd love to hear a lot more about Flywire. Thanks, Ralph, and thanks for having me. Um, for those who don't know, Flywire is a Boston-based uh, tech company. Started off as a company called Peer Transfer, rebranded uh, probably six years ago or so, roughly. Five years ago, um, and our focus is on large sum cross-border transactions. So we started off in education, helping schools like MIT, Harvard, uh, BU, BC collect money from all over the world. And then we realized we had built this payment network that moved money, large sums from different countries. Uh, and then we started applying it to other vertical markets. So expanded from education into healthcare, and then from healthcare into travel. Uh, so those are the three vertical markets that we're in. Uh, this year we'll move over $7 billion in cross-border payment volume, average transaction size north of $10,000, um, and about 85% uh, of that uh, volume goes over our own uh, banking infrastructure that banking partners uh, have helped us set up all over the world. Uh, and so what we do is we provide just enough verticalized software to operationalize that payment process uh, for a payer who may be in China looking to pay over something like WeChat or Alipay or through a bank transfer. And we make it easy for someone like BU or BC to collect that money from all over the world without having to have a global footprint. Global presence. So, awesome. Great product. Thanks a lot. So, and last but not least is uh, Middle Tree. My gosh, thanks for coming. Um, I, we recently met. Um, for those that may or may not know, I'm on the board of Middle Tree. I've been there for about uh, four years, and I know you've recently come into the company from Internoc, where you helped take them public, so it was a very successful company, and you've joined this company, you're now the CEO. And so, uh, big news for you is that uh, you just raised $50 million from a common investor called Great Hill Partners, and now you're looking to change the world with uh, at the helm of Mineral Tree. So, tell us about Mineral Tree and what they do. Yeah, happy to. So, and we're a little bit earlier on the spectrum. So, we just raised our Series C. We're about 75 employees right now. And the problem we're tackling is business to business payments. So, most people focus on, on the business to consumer market, consumer to business market. Uh, business to business payments around the world are it's about $125 trillion change hands every year. It's about three to four X the size of the consumer marketplace. 
And those payments are largely done by paper check right now. The majority of them that are paper check, which is kind of crazy. You think about how you run your personal finances. The fact that businesses still pay each other by checks sent through the mail is kind of crazy. The reason that occurs is because there's a lot of complexity. Complexity with uh, technology complexity, payment system complexity. So Middle Tree is one of a handful of companies that's trying to connect all those things, which is really hard work. It takes a lot of capital to do it. Um, it's hard from a technology perspective, which is one of the things that makes it fun too. So we have a, we're based here in Cambridge and uh, we have a team of 75 people. Once again, we just raised $50 million. So rapidly growing that team and really focusing on solving this kind of age old problem that's existed in the payments world for 75 years or so, which is how do you make those transactions, take them from being paper-based transactions to making them electronic transactions. That's awesome. And while you have the mic, um, I'm going to ask a, a question that everyone was asking us here. You guys could each maybe come back with the mic and answer two questions. One is, how do you define fintech? Because that's a question we get asked a lot, and I'll tell you a little history behind that. And secondly, what would you say is the next the, the innovation that you're doing as part of your company? What's the innovative problem that you're solving? It'd be great to, to hear that. I mean, FinTech is an yeah. interesting one. In some way, I think you have to touch the banking system in some sort of real legitimate way is how I define it, because you can see FinTech from what we're doing, which is helping people get payments on to electronic and, and, and interacting with their banking system in a much more productive way. Obviously, robo-advising and other things, but once again, I think that within the traditional banking structure is, is how I view FinTech has to touch that in a very legitimate way. Um, and what we're doing from an interesting standpoint is a couple of things. We're really doing lots of integration, which is really which is really interesting. So we're integrating with core accounting systems, so ERP systems, you know, net schemes, QuickBooks, you know, all these other things you hear about a lot. Integrating with those and then taking them and then creating integrations with uh, virtual credit card rails. So uh, American Express, Visa, MasterCard, these are all partnerships that we've developed and making taking the ability to take something that used to all happen via paper and make it happen electronically. So it's, it's really converting this piece of the finance world that has existed in paper format. I mean, it's amazing. Like our, our customers, a pretty large organization, say that the benefit of Mineral Tree is I don't have to sign checks anymore. I have to lick envelopes. I mean, it's amazing to me that in this day of age, really sophisticated technology companies, that's the pain point we're solving. Or the reason that those problems have persisted for so long is they're actually hard problems to solve. And we're going about and doing that. And I think that's, that's what makes it fun. And that's what the team enjoys tackling. So for me, uh, when I think of financial technology, it's companies that I think are in either innovating or disrupting or changing the way financial services work. Um, and you know, I think that's the hard part, right? Is that definition keeps getting broader and broader, um, especially as companies keep raising 100 or 50 million dollars. Uh, more companies want to label themselves as financial technology. Um, for us, I think what is differentiating uh, us or what is the big challenge we're adding to it is around globalization. I mean. You know, accepting money and understanding how to get paid in places like China, India, Korea, um, it is not a skill set that is uh, sitting at universities, finance departments. It's not sitting at hospital finance departments. It's not sitting in most businesses. Right? Um, most people who are trying to get paid uh, invoice-based transactions don't understand uh, what are the ways to even pay in some of those countries. Not to mention what are the regulations, what are the legalities that have attached implications of it. So. I think that to me is uh, a daunting task, uh, and most of that money has historically gone over the bank wire system. Um, and I think if people look at that in general, you'll say, hey, it's painful, it's manual, uh, sometimes it's costly depending on the country that you're in, uh, and there's just got to be a better way to do it in this day and age, and that's what we're trying to help do. Yeah. So uh, FinTech is a little different at the bank because obviously what we're talking about here, a lot of it has to do with uh, specifics, payments, making things, you know, traditional processes, sort of flipping those on their head, right, and making them uh, cheaper, include more information, um, more integrated into the government organization, uh, making them more efficient, right? So that's what I think of as sort of traditional fintech. Um, I think at the bank, our, our goal obviously is to improve the financial lives of our customers, so it can be a little bit more broad-based, right? So what we're doing when you think about uh, improving customer service interactions with our customers um, in terms of AI and the different voice commands that we can um, use to improve those interactions or 
blockchain transactions, helping with supply chain, for example, around the world. Um, we also have applications, obviously, with personal finance tools through our AI assistant, Erica. Um, so that's another way that we sort of think about fintech in terms of uh, in terms of AI, like I said. And then finally, it's with the payment processing type partnerships that we have with companies like BlueSnap um, that are really, like I said, sort of flipping flipping on uh, on its head a, a process that was done, you know, the same way for for so long. So I think that's sort of how we see uh, fintech, and it's a lot more than it used to be. Um, but I like to think of fintech as you know a process. Uh, that has existed for so long uh, as being sort of your traditional gas station cup of coffee, right? Like it gets the job done when you're on a road trip and you have that cup of coffee and it, it does its job. And FinTech comes in and really makes your coffee a red eye. And it throws that shot of espresso in and turbocharges a process that's been done a certain way for however long and can really um, increase the value to the organization and to the customers and clients that you're serving. So I think we're fairly aligned in our definition of fintech now. And uh, I will say it's, it's it's really the movement of money, which has been broken for a very, very long time. And I, I think those problems will persist for a very, very long time uh, due to just legacy stuff, um, security, compliance, consumer disputes, all of those things. There's still a lot of runway, by the way, left in fintech uh, and the movement of money. And it's interesting when I'm sitting here listening to everybody else when we talk about this, when I first got in this industry, my job was to convince people to take credit cards instead of cash. And that was uh, 25 years ago. That we think about that. Most places actually took checks and cash. A few took, uh, especially in upstate rural areas where I was working, uh, only a few took cards, uh, payment cards. Um, and even 10 years ago, it was pretty uncommon to see people using your credit card at Dunkin' Donuts. It was still cash-based. And we still have a lot of innings left to go in this as, as far as... Uh, Fixing the the financial system and, and making the money or making it easier to transfer and move money. Um, for Tesis, which is now the the company that bought Cayenne, we're a larger organization, so a little less focused than some of the other panelists here. Uh, I think we move about 200 billion dollars in our own bins, and then maybe double that in indirect, where our clients are uh, have their own bins, bank bins, and where they're just the technology for that. Um, but we are doing some really interesting things, particularly around payment facilitation, which I know Ralph knows very well here. Um, we do think that's one of the next big plays in payments that the tri-party merchant agreements, um, not to get too technical, uh, that we're used to are, are not the way to go. Uh, there are better ways to do that. And one of the things that people probably don't know about pieces is we're the uh, second largest healthcare payments uh, provider in the United States. And if you think payments as we know them is broken, wait until you get into healthcare payments. Um, I promise you that it's far more broken and far more complex uh, and a lot of room to grow there as well. That's awesome. Thanks, those are great. Um, so I was gonna ask you a question to focus a little bit on Boston, right? So these companies are all in Boston. There's more other, there's other companies in Boston that started up like Toast, for example, PayPal is here, ECI is here, right? A lot of FinTech going on here. And so one of the things that we thought we'd, we'd ask is, uh, you've all hired, uh, doubled your employees probably in the last few years. How hard is it to find employees that understand FinTech? And I, and I asked this for a couple of reasons. because I think all of you have actually spoken at a school and trained a little bit in FinTech class. And I see uh, my alma mater out there at Stonehill, but we've been working on a FinTech program um, to actually train people coming out of college in fintech because they come out in a program marketing management but it's hard to find people who have sort of done what you're doing and train them and bring them on so i'd like to ask you know why boston and why hiring uh, uh people in boston here and why it's a, it's a good spot to be in boston for fintech so if you get a little color locally sure so first of all it doesn't appear that tough for Blue Snap to hire FinTech people in Boston based on the number of Cayenne people here today. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> but beyond that, um, I'd say it's become a lot easier in the last five, ten years here in Boston. It's amazing to see the number of companies spring up. Um, and we do tr all trade employees here. If you look, you've got Samsung Pay, uh, which was Loop. Um, you have Ingenico, which used to be Loop and Samsung Pay, or the, the old founder, uh, Rome, yeah, all, all of these companies. So um, over the years, we've trained this FinTech community in Boston through these startups who are successful, 
um, not just because they have people who are in fintech, because we have a lot of really smart people in Boston that will make any company successful. And now we have this pool to pull from. Um, for us at Cayenne, when we first started our merchant warehouse, Boston was a really attractive market, just because the, the talent we had that we could train up in fintech. Uh, there was really nobody in you know 2000, 2001 that was in, well, we didn't even call it FinTech then, but payments. Um, but over the last few years, we've had this cluster uh, of companies pop up that I think is, is really interesting and really easy to pull from. And, and I'll, not easy to pull from, but at least find people. Um, and a lot of some of the most innovative stuff, I'd say, in the, the whole country right now is coming out of Boston. Yeah, so this question is obviously a little different for me because we don't really hire people that necessarily uh, know a ton about FinTech on a daily basis. We have people who focus on uh, companies uh, in the tech space, uh, and, I'm, and I'm obviously one of them. Um, but I think the, the more interesting thing to, to, to mention from the bank perspective is that our middle market portfolio, if we're, we have one of the oldest banks uh, in, in commercial lending in Boston and have a huge market share here, obviously, uh, given predecessor organizations. but um, the, the middle market clients that we're dealing with have changed drastically. I've been with the bank for, <clears throat> excuse me, 11 years, and when I first started, we were, our portfolio was made up of distributors, manufacturing companies, you know, some retail, um, but really traditional sort of, uh, you know, widgets, that type of thing. Really classic middle market companies. In the past just five years, probably since I got back to London, I went to London for a year, and that's where I met Ralph. Um, the, the landscape changed in Boston. There were all these companies that weren't just small companies anymore. They were meaningful disruptors in not only the fintech industry, but the technology industry as a whole in Boston. And we sort of looked at it as this is something that we have to we have to change how we approach uh, our portfolio in terms of the, the greater Boston market. So we really put a focus on um, you know meeting with those companies, learning about what their needs are, seeing if there's ways that the bank can be helpful. There's a lot of banks that have been working with tech companies for a long time. You think of like an SCB or a Comerica, Bridge, um, banks like that. And and that wasn't really our bread and butter for the past you know, hundreds of years, obviously. Um, but as, as the world has changed, as Boston has changed, we've realized that we had to put a bigger focus on it. And so that's why we're trying to, you know, make people have a bit more specialization in the companies that they focus on um, because we see how important it is. It's not going away. The valuations are getting bigger. The number of unicorns in Boston are, are uh, increasing every day, and um, it's something that we know we can be helpful to those companies, and we have to uh, really, really keep on it. So it's fun. That's great. Yeah, I think, I think for me, you look at look at brokerage, look at banking, uh, investment firms. There's just a there's a pedigree in Boston of a lot of the big companies that are related to financial services, and I think that helps speed the system too. Um, when you look at the younger generation as well, you couldn't have a better set of academic places to pull from, right? So I think those combinations for us are really powerful, whether it's bringing in, uh, you know, flymates for us, employees, uh, bringing in flymates that have uh, less experience straight out of school or grad school. It's a great feeder system uh, and just having a spot to do that in Boston, I think really helps. Um, and then when you look at some of the big institutions, I look at like my compliance, legal, risk, regulatory team. Um, those teams are, you know, who's who, people from Fidelity or from State Street or from places that are well established and they bring in a level of expertise around regulation, globalization, business. So I think that combination to me is pretty powerful. And I, you know, if I had to add a third, it'd probably be just the mindset, right? Anybody that's raised money out in the West Coast, uh, you know, Boston has a bit more practicality in the mindset, uh, and maybe a bit more hustle. Um, and so I think I think that uh, I think that helps lead to it as well because you can't just uh, you know when you see a company trying to come in and disrupt a financial service and do it from completely outside or not understanding a lot of the uh, the structure that needs to go into disrupting that service right and a lot of that credibility you know, we went in we're asking people to move fifty million dollars in tuition payments or medical payments with us and we had you know millions of dollars in balance sheet not fifty million dollars in balance sheet right so. You have to have a little bit of uh, pragmatism too, which I think folks in Boston. I agree. I mean, I think you know, look at. It. I mean, look at the historical industries in Boston, right? Uh, John Hancock and Fidelity and Old Fleet. I mean, you see this amazing pedigree of financial services in Boston, and then combine that with a culture based in technology and entrepreneurship, and combine those two things together. So it's not surprising that you're seeing 
really fintech grow as a segment here? I think beyond that, when you think about building out a team, as Mike was just mentioning, you think about, all right, who are the people that can, we can bring in from traditional history or the traditional, traditional industry? Um, but beyond that, a big part of is who, who's been through the startup growth cycle before? It's such a huge piece when you think about uh, people from all parts of the organization, from sales to technology development, you name it, right? All have different points and different points of growth in a startup, whether it be a startup in any part of tech and definitely including fintech. And having people that have been through that is such a key part of what you can find in Boston. And when you fill out a team, you want people from the fintech industry for sure, from maybe just financial services in general, whether it be regulatory or whatever, but also just people from the tech industry. And in Boston, you can combine all of those together. So I think that's what's created me such fertile ground for the development of this uh, fintech cluster here in Boston. I know we, we certainly leverage all of those as we're building our team rapidly. Great point. And maybe uh, one more question, and there might be a couple from the, the crowd, though, is um, so obviously what's happened in fintech is we recently there's been these mega mergers, right? These the, the, the biggest IPO, I mean, uh, money spent on mergers and acquisitions ever in, the, and I can't remember the exact number, but it's well over, I think, a uh, uh, hundred billion, right? And so it's a huge number. That's going to create a lot more innovation and a lot more um, change in our space. And so, obviously, besides all you guys who've done super well, the companies are super successful. Is there another company out there that you guys sort of admire or you think we should be kind of watching um, that's going to come into the foyer more and more over the next um, 12 to 24 months because of all the acquisition change? And, and just throw it to any one of you guys to throw a name or two out there that we should be watching or paying attention to. In Boston? No, um, it could be anywhere in the world. This is global. Let's keep it Boston. We okay, like it. We we'll like keep it local. Well, they're not here. I mean, I, I think Toast is doing amazing things. Like I gotta tell you, I love what Toast is doing because they're solving such a simple problem, right? Not only they they bridge the fintech gap, but also, I mean, POS systems. Like, how much is it to solve? And you go to a restaurant and just work. It's super <laughs> simple, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Seriously, I mean, it's just it's easy. But taking something that for so long and make it simple, right? I mean, yeah. such a great example of taking something that was yeah. hard, that was should have been simple but wasn't, and make it simple. Right. So uh, I'll bring them up in bits because they're Boston based too. Good, that works. Yeah, you know, I would say you look at the mega mergers and you have to broadly look at the way that card schemes are making moves. You got to look at the way the banking infrastructure folks like MIS Advisor are making moves. Uh, obviously, merchant processing consolidating. I think to me that's just a fascinating dynamic to look at. Um, and then, you know, I mean, somebody like a PayPal could just continue to raise their game up. So I think all that's coming together in financial. And I think it's going to be fascinating to watch because I don't think any one of them has every piece of the puzzle yet. Right. And in addition to that, I think there's so much room to win. So I think you're going to see companies like Stripe and others. Stripe's probably, to me, one of the most interesting ones is being most aggressive yeah. and can probably defend itself from consolidation if it wants to. Yeah. Um, and I think it'll be interesting to watch how innovation happens between some of the industry, uh, you know, grandfathers and grandmothers, if you will, and some of the new up and coming companies. Yeah, so I can't say a ton about companies that I think we should all watch because a lot of them are still private and we work with and I wouldn't want to share that information. Um, here, but uh, some of the names that were mentioned, obviously, Coast is doing incredible things, and um, I think the, the, the longer-term vision for companies like that is, is really powerful. Um, some of the other names that, you know, everyone knows about in town uh, in terms of marketplaces and along the same line and food, Easy Cater is doing really cool things, and we're hearing a lot more about, about them lately. And then I think the other area that is sort of hot right now in FinTech, especially in Boston, um, that we should keep keep an eye on those companies as this sort of concept of AI enabled human interaction. Um, I think we've all, you know, gotten over the hump of determining that AI isn't going to remove all these jobs like we thought it would, and that the most powerful applications um, of AI are, are in that AI enhanced, AI supported human interaction. Um, so I think a lot of the companies that, uh, that are doing that type of work are going to be ones we're going to be hearing a lot more about today. Just in case people don't know what toast is, it's, it's, you know, can you give a little dissertation, please? Um, I'm supposed to describe toast. It's not my company. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
so uh, Toast cloud-based point of sale system, um, and, and they, like a few others, have found a real niche there where a lot of these merchants, we were talking about this earlier, are still operating on these legacy point of sale systems, some of which still have to get CD-ROMs mailed to them to upgrade their platforms, upgrade their systems. And uh, there are some of these companies that have just figured out that where there's legacy tech, um, it's easy to disrupt with new systems. They may not be able to go out and convince people to rip, rip out that legacy tech, uh, but they can certainly get the new up-and-comers and, -comers and uh, grow really fast for introducing new cloud-based systems like Toastest. Um, as far as these mega mergers go, though, I will say one thing. Very rarely do you see these massive mergers result in strong top-line organic growth. Uh, it's really more about bottom-line growth and creating a balance sheet that you can go out and buy faster-growing players to create that top-line growth. Um, so as you see these companies come together, I probably shouldn't be saying too much about this, uh, working at TSIS against bought by Global, um, <laughs> it, it, they're usually not bastions for innovation and um, going out and taking smaller companies. They are very smart, strategic plays that I think make a lot of sense. Um, but it really does create this vacuum for these smaller companies to come in and become mid-sized companies, either to be ultimately acquired or just go public or, or live out their life as a, a larger company. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot of that. Uh, I think there are, are you know, you're going to see maybe not as strong top line growth in some of these companies. Um, and that there will be companies, you know, some which in the room that will take market share from them. And as far as, you know, what I like right now, and I'm not just saying this uh, because of the, the panelists and the hosts here, uh, I think international payments are really big at this point. Um, I think that's broken and fragmented for a number of very logical reasons, mostly different governments, different laws, uh, different currencies. I, I think whoever fixes that um, fixes a lot of things right there. And I still am a big believer in, in uh, the e-commerce players out there, uh, be it the Shopify's of the world that can make it really simple to come online and, and uh, will eventually, I think, create some powerful marketplaces. I, I do think there's room to grow there. I don't think Amazon is going to completely dominate, especially with some of the political pressure on them right now, uh, regulatory pressure. Um, and I do think we'll see some some real winners in that space as well. That's awesome. Wonderful comments. Um, I thought I'd open it up to see if there's any quick questions from the group. Um, if anyone has anything they want to ask any of our panelists, you can raise your hand, shout it out. Either questioned out or ready for a cocktail. Uh, Who won the game tonight? Oh, that's my final question. <laughs> <laughs> Don't listen to him. <laughs> oh, uh, is there is there uh, questions? Yeah, it's a real question. <laughs> um, I have a question on where what you think the roles of the traditional banking, commercial banking, is going to be in the future. I think we we work for a commercial bank. Um, I think that we. You know, we watch in awe of all the innovation and uh, things that you're doing. And uh, I just like kind of like the moonshot. What's going to be the future of payments um, 20 years from now? Where where are the traditional banks going to be? What roles will those they play? Will they continue? To play? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So just to repeat it, the question was, what a, what role will the traditional banks play? Since I'm paraphrasing here, they're not innovating as quick with some of the cool technologies and products <laughs> that is coming, especially that's on our panel here. So. Jordan, I, I, I know, I'm so sorry. I <laughs> um, but I think that was the question, right? Does anyone want to take a shot? No, and we've always been a big believer, so we partner with probably 12 of the leading global banks. Um, and so to me, it's a cornerstone of financial services and fintech. Uh, I think anybody that's out there historically bashing banks, I think it's pulled back from that line. Um, you've seen some companies very famously bash them publicly, and they've kind of realized, wait a second, you can't move money, you can't store money, mm -hmm. really, crypto's not going to save them, save the world tomorrow. So I, I think people are resetting some of those expectations. Um, and I think banks have always been the best at trust. They've been the best at storing money and lending money, right? And even when lending tech came in, um, it, it really didn't disrupt the banks. It was disrupting the poor lending process, right? And so I think more of the disruption isn't about disrupting legacy players. It's more about disrupting poor user experience. And I think that's where you saw banks close a gap really quickly, right? Oh, we're not going to get out, out, out onboarded. We're not going to get out uh, lending applications, right? And you're seeing innovation around mortgages, and around lending, and those kind of things. And, and I think that the challenge with payments is that a lot of the banks been geographically limited. Even the global banks are 
really just siloed banks inside a broader umbrella. Mm -hmm. And I think the hard part is that payments are changing so quickly that banks are going to have to be part of that ecosystem. But I think it's unlikely that any bank can be global enough to own it all or fix it all. So I think that's where you're going to see more partnerships. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I'll address that. I mean, I certainly see banks uh, being a great partner for fintech, and I think necessarily so. So we have 29 bank partners that resell our product. So our partner is actually built for banks, so that way they can resell it as their own and offer the opportunity of a fintech uh, and technology platform, but obviously not have to carry the burden of developing the technology on their own. Um, what I see is so I think and we, we see that rapidly evolving, I'd say just over the past year. In fact, this year alone, our, our inside sales team has inbounds from banks saying, how do we start carrying the Middle Street platform? That, that did not ever occur a couple of years ago, right? So I think banks have largely awoken to the fact that how do we get on board with this movement so that way we're not left behind. And I think as Mike said, banks bring a lot of strengths to it. One of the things is I think the customer service piece is in some way is the easy part to figure out. I think the bank operating model is a harder challenge to figure out from a go-to-market standpoint. I mean, think about fintechs that don't have a strategy like we do uh, partnering with banks can be a lot more nimble than banks can be from um, what does the bundled offering look like? How are we bringing solutions that actually address customers' needs in, in one offering and meet customers where they're at? I think that's the hard part that banks are still figuring out right now, but a number of them um, I think are well on that path and realize that that's a big thing that they need to work on and are, are figuring out right now. So I think there's a great partnership opportunity there. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Another question? Another question? Oh, there's, there's, oh, I think I should be allowed to answer. <laughs> 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 um, I, I have a question about the Middle Street platform. Um, no, all I was going to say is I think that uh, in terms of the banking landscape, like I said, it's changed so much just in the past 11 years that I've been in banking um, that I think it's just going to continue to to be important to us. And not speaking on behalf of the bank, but sort of the banking industry as a whole, I think a lot of us, especially the bigger banks that um, have been doing things a certain way for so long, and most of that was because there weren't better solutions, right? So um, when you think of things like real-time payments, which is coming out this year, there, there wasn't another clearing platform like that for 40 years. So this is a huge thing that's, that's coming to market. So a lot has just been the same for so long that I think that's why it's taking the banks a little longer to sort of mm -hmm. take their heads up and say, hey, maybe we shouldn't be building all these homegrown systems and maybe we shouldn't be trying to do all this ourselves. Um, there are opportunities for partnership where we can find the best in breed providers for certain pieces of our ecosystem. You know, that's most important. Obviously, those um, partnerships take quite a long time to work through and, and get done. <laughs> As Ralph knows, um, but but the end result is partnering with some of the best organizations to deliver what we think is again um, helping us down our path of improving the financial lives of our customers. So I think uh, it'll just continue to evolve. But I do think that the banks are finally starting to realize that you know you can't do everything yourself, and um, the, the sort of robust growth that's happened in fintech in the past 10 years is is really important and warrants us picking our heads up and paying attention to it. So the theme is partnership. <laughs> you get that one? Yeah, that, that they're all, it's amazing how we all partner so much with the banks. We have at least 30, 30, and you said 15 or 12. It's, it's unbelievable. So that is partnership. The banks are looking to partner, and I think that's how we how, how we work together. So there's another question on the floor. Thank you. Um, I'll agree that banks are now more partners than competitors. So I want to understand how you are thinking about your competitors within the fintech space. So, for example, Mike, how are you thinking about differentiating against a player like Remitly, right? Or Jordan, as you're advising some of your clients, how do you help them cut through the noise in terms of choosing a provider? You know, you have Braintree, you have Snack, you have um, Stripe. How do you go about, you know, thinking about competition within the FinTech disruptor space? That's a good question. Yeah, so, um, you know, when we're advising our clients, right, we're – we're trying to talk to them about what we think is best for their structure and their needs and what works best for them. So when we're uh, talking about, you know, acquiring and payment processing, obviously our partnership with BAMS is uh, hugely important and the relationship with first data. Um, but as we think about, you know, sort of the future, I think that's what's so important about the partnership that, that we have now with BlueSnap. It's offering something to our clients that might not make sense for all clients. I don't think there's every single pitch that all of my peers go on where merchant processing is on the table with a client, I don't think BlueSnap's going to be the right fit for all of them. And I think you guys know that too. 
I think it's finding, making sure the bankers are educated on, you know, figuring out what those opportunities are in terms of which the best fits are for BlueSnap and which the best fit is for, uh, you know, our offering with BAM. So I, I think it's just a matter of listening to our clients' needs and really truly understanding not only what our clients do, what they want to do, where they think they're going, and then figure out if, if it makes sense for, you know, the partnerships that we have to, to be um, sort of cross-sold or talked through and, and presented. So um, I think that's a huge piece of it is just truly understanding what makes the most sense for our clients. Right. I think for us, the thing you see uh, us do is focus. Um, you know, I think when people look at cross-border payments in general, they look at how much money is moving around the world through the bank systems, through money remittance companies, through payment processors, and they kind of make a generalization. I think the investor community created this where they say, look at all the money moving around the world. I can go get it all. And the reality is all moving for different reasons, right? And, and so I think you have to really dive into that use case. You have to understand why that money is going from point A to point B. And money moving from the U.S. to China is very different than money moving from China to the U.S. Right? And so those kind of nuances, I think, are really, really important. Um, and so for us, what we do is we make sure that we're a focus on a vertical market, similar to someone like Toast, where uh, it's not just about the payment processing. It's not just about money going from point A to point B. It's all the stuff around that, right? And how do we make sure that when we insert our payment processing, it actually solves the pain point, right? It just doesn't just get money there, but it helps with things like reconciliation, customer service, you know, fraud detection, right? All the other stuff that goes with the types of payments we're processing that is very specific to our customers and our segment. So I think I think you'll see less, and you're seeing it in fintech. You're seeing less horizontal plays. You're seeing more people associated to a vertical market or a sector, and apply financial technology to solve the pain point of the sector. Uh, and so I think for us, that's our that's going to be our focus. We don't want to move all the money in the world. We don't want to move open loop money. Um, or help people send money back home to their families. That's not our gig. Um, we want to help people make very large payments to our clients who are the billers. And so by focusing on that use case and on focusing on verticals, um, I think there's a lot of players that can win going after all that money from around the world. And it's, it, 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 can't be, it can't be won by one person. Agreed. So we're coming up on the top of the hour, which I promise we release you guys. But obviously, Boston, the city of champions, Big game tonight. Big game. Uh, first time we had a game seven in about 100 years. Probably innovating to the pace of uh, old FinTech. <laughs> so we need a score prediction from you guys as the uh, final answer here. And uh, we'll hopefully get a consensus. So, Henry, you want to lead us off? I've got three 1Bs. I'm going to go with 4 nothing b 5-1-Bs. <laughs> Four one beans. <laughs> <my answer. laughs> so we'd love to really give you guys a big hand, uh, big hand. for questions, but thanks everyone for coming, and uh, look forward to seeing you soon. So thanks, guys. Thank you.